Good morning. It's good to see all of you. And just in response to um, all of Bill's praise about me being a teacher, I never wanted to be a teacher, uh, ever. And when I graduated from Carson Newman, I had a degree in sociology and psychology and anything away from teaching. So I moved um, to um, Portsmouth, Virginia, and then to Virginia Beach with some family. And I worked in a private psych hospital. And I also taught kindergarten in a, an all-black kindergarten, just the principal and myself. And in that summer, I, um, the Lord enlarged my heart and I saw the looks on these inner city children. And um, suddenly, uh, I wanted to teach. So I think it was the Lord's will for one particular reason. My mother had sent me an application to teach in Hawkins County Schools. And um, I threw it away. I didn't fill it out, I threw it away. But not many days later, I got a call from Hawkins County Schools, and they offered me a job. So, what I would say to you is, I love to teach. And um, it has made, helped to shape me for who I am today. And I believe that as we get older and we have experiences as Christians with what God is doing in our lives, that it is all of our respons responsibility to share with other people. Not You don't have to be a teacher, but as a teacher, I have the opportunity to pour into you what the Holy Spirit has poured into me as I study and read. So it's just very rewarding, and it is my calling, I guess. So as long as the Lord allows me, I will uh, be glad to, to teach his word. So having said that, we are we have two very interesting topics today and we find that last week jesus was trying to get away to a remote place you remember that he and the disciples and remember the disciples had been sent out by jesus two by two to evangelize and when we started last week's lesson they had just gotten back, and see, he had given them his authority. So they had healed some people, cast out devils, and they had to be really excited about what to tell, what they had to tell Jesus. But they didn't get the time because um, they were interrupted with the 5,000 last. So this is getaway number two today. Um, Jesus is trying again to get away to a quiet place, and his goal remains the same. He wants to teach his disciples privately. And how long was Jesus' earthly ministry? Three years. And he didn't have a lot of time. 
And so I guess you could talk about it walking, but if you have 12 disciples in Jesus, you know, you're not going to. And so remembering that the disciples are young men um, that Jesus called mostly away from fishing, but some other things, they are still spiritually dull. And that just means they haven't had their eyes open fully yet. They still have, they have seen miracles, but he needs to teach them more, and time is wasting. So today, Jesus goes out of Jewish country, and he goes into Gentile country. And so I guess that would be... He thought maybe if he was in Gentile country, there wouldn't be so many people who knew him, but they did, and he just couldn't hide. He just couldn't hide. So he goes to the towns of Tyre and Sidon, and if I understand correctly, um, they're on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It's just so beautiful. And there's a big story about Tyre and Sidon, but it's not our lesson today. So Jesus takes the disciples, and for the first time that is documented, he leaves the Jewish area, and he goes into a Gentile area. And so as we read this, you're going to see that he goes into a house. We don't know whose house doesn't really make any difference. But his intention, and this is going to be very important a little bit later, his intention was privacy. So he could have time to teach his disciples. And so it didn't work out again. Um, but I want to pause right here just a minute to talk about the word intention. Um, if you intend to do something, what does that mean? Yes, you're going to do it if circumstances are all right, if, if it works out, but that's your plan to do something, uh, and you have plan for that. So that was Jesus' intention. And you know what happens with a lot of our intentions? They just don't, you know, they just don't work out. So I'm talking about this mainly because in the next story that we're going to look at, we're, we're going to see something else about Jesus' intention. So we're going to move on, and I'm going to read the story. I'm going to read the text from the scripture uh, in Mark 7, uh, 24 through 30. And this is the account of the Syrophoenician woman. And I did not say welcome to those of you who are watching us this morning, and somebody was having a birthday. No. Oh, Emily Lyons, I know you're there because she watches us every week. Happy birthday later this week. So we're in Mark 7. Now Jesus got up and went from there to the region of Tyre and Sidon. It is thought that he was probably in Capernaum, but that was Jewish country. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know about it, and yet he could not escape. You know what the Pavarazzi are? They chase around after uh, Hollywood stars. Well, low, <laughs> not so big. But you know, these people, why do you think they were after him? Yeah, he was, he, he was a, yes, he was famous, and they heard of him. 
and they heard rumors and they knew some true stories. And you know, when we become desperate, um, we do things that we wouldn't normally do. And so we see, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but we see this woman um, that we're going to meet um, who's a Gentile, and she's desperate. So we'll talk about her in, in just a minute. But after hearing about him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, we don't know her name, of Syrophoenician descent, and she repeatedly, and the Hebrew word for repeatedly means she just wore him out asking. Do you ever have any of your children who do that or your grandchildren? I have one that will just ask you till you go, okay. This was that woman. But why she did it, two things. Her little daughter was possessed with a demon, and she was desperate. She was desperate. So she repeatedly asked Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, I spent some time here looking at that. If you recall, earlier in some other studies, we learned that there was a derogatory name for the Gentiles. Do you remember what it was? Dogs. Yeah. They're just scoundrels, dirty dogs. We're Gentiles, you know. We're Gentiles. So I looked and read several things about what Jesus said here because it seems out of character somewhat for him. So one of the things that is talked about here is that... Um, let me go one more page. That this is figurative language. And so I'm going to fill in the blank for you with some other words so you can look at that same um, scripture. And it would say, let the children, meaning his disciples, first be filled that means he would be saying, this is my priority. This is why I'm here today, is to teach my disciples. So let the children, the disciples, be fed, for it is not right to take the children, the disciples, um, bread and throw it to the dogs. Now there's another... Um, way that that could have been said. And it could be that he was talking about the eventuality of the Gentiles were going to be brought in to the favor of God, but the Jews came first. You know that if you studied the New Testament. Jesus was sent to the Jews. And what did his own people do? Did they receive him? Not, no. Some, not the scribes and the Pharisees. They received him not. But we see later in the New Testament where God calls Paul to take the word to the Gentiles. So, in other words, what Jesus is saying to this woman is that his first priority that day was to teach his disciples. That was his first priority. Or he could have been saying his first priority was to speak with the Jews and spend his time 
um, with the Jews, and after the Jews had a chance, then the Gentiles could come. So the dog part worried me a little bit, but if you look at the definition, what he was talking about here is a house dog, and it uses a different word. There's one word that talks about wild dogs that run and, and they're tearing things up. That would be the derogatory word that people used for the Gentiles. But Jesus is saying, this is like a house dog or a puppy. And so there was something about this woman that there are no words really to describe, but I'm going to see if we can, if maybe we can touch on that. So possibly Jesus was saying, first, I have to help my own family, the Jews. Or, lady, get in line and take your turn because the children get fed first and then the dogs get the leftovers. So those are possibilities. But uh, we, we're going to see that there was something that was unspoken that happened between Jesus and this woman. And we have to remember that if there was anyone that we read about who was um, a Gentile of the worst kind, it would have been this woman. She had no right to come into this private house. First of all, she was a woman. He was a rabbi, the original rabbi. And so when she comes in, that verse says she fell at his feet, which could mean her burden was so heavy because her daughter was going to die. And it could have also meant respect. Now, just think about this. Could you see yourself, if you were desperate for something for your child, and you knew what she knew, and, and so you wanted to see this doctor, so you don't make an appointment, you just go and hope you can just get in there and see him. That's what, that's what she was doing. And every time, I think this is so interesting, every time as we read what Jesus says to her, her faith just gets stronger and stronger. I just think that's really awesome. So she is an unnamed woman who comes immediately as soon as she's heard. And I thought, too, do any of you know anything about begging, I mean, from personal experience? I, I couldn't think any of seeing people who were begging, except when I was just old enough to go to school, we went to Kingsport once a year for, for school supplies. And on Broadway, in front of one of the banks, there were some people who had disabilities that were sitting out there. And some of them had some um, very serious I would assume their family brought them, and they were selling pencils. Mostly couldn't talk, but very seriously disabled people. Now, that's been a long time ago, and that doesn't happen, but it left a real impression on me because in our lifetimes, I don't think we have seen beggars. Um, well, my grandmother used to say, there was um, two old men that came by. Their names were Fate and Bob Richards. <laughs> well, y if you knew Fate and Bob, you'd love them. And I was looking, I'm, I'm running a rabbit. But um, they lived over, over across Burham Bridge. And so my dad would pick them up and take them home. And so... He pulls up in front of this old store building where they live. 
and there's only one light bulb that hangs down from the ceiling, and it's on. And one of them says, well, I be doggone, he left the lights on all over the house. <laughs> and so that's kind of my, um, you know, introduction. And they would go by my grandmother's, and they went by one day and asked for a glass of water. She gave them both a glass of water. They took a drink or two, threw it out, and said, now how about that sandwich? So this generation that we're talking about now, many people begged in order to um, have their, their needs met. So she came to Jesus not based on her worth, because she was a nobody for all practical purposes, but she came because she was desperate. So we see what Jesus said to her, and now we're going to listen to her response. And she answered and said unto him, Lord, yes, get the dogs under the table, eat of the children's crumbs. That was an unusual way for a woman to speak to a man, but it was a gracious response. And yet I feel like something passed between them that they understood. Just a look of compassion, and because and Jesus changes his mind. So she was equal to this occasion, this woman was. She was a strong woman. And she was not resentful when Jesus mentioned the dogs. She did not take that as um, any way to feel bad about herself. So uh, she, she, in essence, said, Master, but don't the dogs under the table get scraps dropped by the children? She has a good point there. Um, some people that have dogs, I don't, but uh, they, they come and eat under the table. I had a little dog, and um, he always would beg at the table, but we didn't feed him. And so after he passed away, the kids would somebody spills something and the kids would go, oh, don't worry, Mac, you'll get it. So, so she has this very good point. And she also knows this. Jesus had every right to refuse. He didn't have to even listen. He had every right to refuse. And she knew that he could heal this child without interrupting his teaching. I thought, I, it took me a while to see that. But Jesus was trying to carve out time to teach his disciples, and she interrupts. But she had the faith to know that he didn't have to go to her house. He could speak it. He had done that before. And so she knew that it wouldn't interrupt and that all he had to do was say the word. So the more that Jesus had said about not having her time, the more faith she had. And eventually, Jesus speaks to her and grants her request. Possibly he was speaking Greek to her because she spoke Greek and Aramaic, maybe. Uh, she was a Samaritan woman, Samaritan um, um, Phoenician. So she admits to Jesus that the children must be fed, but that the dogs can get fed at the same time. She wasn't trying to get a seat at the table. She wasn't trying to better herself. She just was there for her child. 
and she was asking for whatever crumbs that Jesus would give her. I'm satisfied with the crumbs of Jesus, aren't you? So, verse 29, And he said to her, For this saying, Go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. And he did this because of her faith, her humility, and her unselfishness. So he granted her request. And so the disciples, that took very little time. It doesn't tell us this, but it would tell us that Jesus now would have some time to teach his disciples. So it also tells us that Jesus is moved by our insistence. That means persistence. That means when we keep praying. It doesn't necessarily mean when he begs us to give, for him to give us something. But it does mean that when we pray and we are desperate, that we are humble, and that we put our um, petition in front of him, and then we say, Lord, whatever your will is, whatever your will is, I, I will accept that. I will do it. Okay, so now we're going to the last part of the lesson, because now Jesus walks off and they are again on the move and this time they are going toward the coast of, and because they haven't gotten to Tyre they're leaving Tyre and Sidon and they're going to a place called Decapolis which is really a combination uh, a collection of several Gentile cities so I'm going to read 31 through 37, and then I want to go back and um, pause at verse 34. So, And again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came into the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they beseech him, that means the same almost as beg, they ask, they beseech him to put his hand upon this man. And so Jesus took the man aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears and spit and touched his tongue. Verse 34 and looking up to heaven, Jesus sighed and said, Ephatha, that's Aramaic, the only Aramaic word I know. And straight, it means be opened. And straightway, the man's ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them that they should tell no man. But the more he charged them, so much the more they published what they had seen and were beyond measure astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. So as we come to the close, I guess today, I just want to uh, go back and look at verse 34. Probably when Jesus healed this man, he used some sign language, some gestures, because the man couldn't hear, and he took him to a private place. What do you think? Yeah, and he'd probably been made fun of 
for years. So he's uh, very considerate about that. So um, in verse 34, I'm going to just read this part of it again. And looking up to heaven, he sighed. Now, I want to talk about sighing. You sigh. Can you help it? It's kind of a bodily function. I read something that said, like a definition that said, we sigh frequently, and it's just a, a normal. Yeah, it's good for your lungs, and it's exhaling. And so I was thinking about that, and I thought, hmm. I don't know of any other scripture. There may be two where it's written that Jesus sighed. But before the deaf and dumb man heard a word from Jesus, Jesus had looked up in the heaven. Now, the man would know what that was for, wouldn't he? Look up to God. And he sighed. And I thought... Well, I, I can see Jesus commanding something, weeping, calling forth the dead, creating all of creation with a word. But a God who sighs, now, sighs can be positive or negative, like, we were talking about this at lunch yesterday, and I asked my eighth grade granddaughter, what is it that makes you sigh? And she looked at me, and she said, going to school on Monday morning, sitting down, and the teacher says we're having a pop quiz. Yeah. Uh, it makes me sigh if something, uh, somebody shows up when, before Bill passed away, he invited all these people every Sunday to our house for lunch. And I sighed a lot and hoped that, you know, the Lord would multiply the food. Uh, just a funny, just a funny part of that. But when we sigh, it's, um, you can hear it. And it's, it's when we exhale heavily. And it could also mean to groan. Yeah, if you all come to my house for lunch today, you'll be groaning because I don't have anything to feed you there. It could be a moan. Um, it's, it could be several things. But when I thought about a God who sighs, then I, I, I kept on thinking and kept on reading. And... And so I guess what came to me is when God created the world, his intention was not that we would be separated. I'm looking for Genesis 1.28, and this was Jesus' intention in, in the book of Genesis. This is what he said to Adam be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over every living thing that moves on the earth. So that was God's intention when he created at the end of the seventh day and man and woman were in the garden of Eden. Okay? And God walked among them, and it was perfect until, until sin. So God's intention was, um, I don't know, ruined maybe by sin. That was his intention, but that didn't happen. And so we look on, and, and I thought this was, also a good answer to that. Why did God, what did he intend more for us than what we just read? And it says, 
he intended for us to love him. And he loves us. And he intended to share all the overflow from everything he had created and who he was. And he wanted us to enjoy him. And he enjoyed us. So that didn't happen yet. And when Adam and Eve made the bad decision in the garden, then God's intention was blemished. And so, when Jesus looked into the eyes of the deaf and dumb man, it was very natural for him to sigh for this reason. You know, I think he probably did when we felt his conviction, and when we were ready to give him our heart. So maybe he thought it was never intended, never intended to be this way. He was feeling the burden for what was not intended, for what had happened uh, in the garden. And so we can say that was a holy sigh, that sigh that Jesus made. Because it assures us that God still sighs or groans for his people, for us. Because we sigh, but you know there's coming a day, and I... Thought of that song, uh, No More Crying Here, We Are Going to See the King. No more groaning or sighing here. And so in our hearts, we have this longing for what was intended that didn't happen, but it's going to. And so Jesus groaned for his people, us. The scripture also tells us that creation groans because they are waiting for God to make it right. He longs for the day when all will be made new, as do I, as do you, when the new heaven and the new earth come down and Things will be as he intended from the beginning. And so we long with hope. And I, I, that's the conclusion, I think, of what to say today. We long with hope. It's the hope that God gave us when Jesus looked up to the Father and got his direction and he still longs for his people. And we will, as believers, be with him forever and forever. Let's pray. Lord, we, we love you. We love you. And we know that you love us. That is our hope. Lord, I pray for each person who's here. I pray for each person who will join us for this service this morning. I pray that your Holy Spirit will be so filled in this room today that we will acknowledge that presence. Thank you for your word. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.